So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm gonna be presenting uh, some joint work uh, with my colleagues at Microsoft Research um, and Microsoft uh, Azure ML. Uh, so this is work is about um, now there, another head of allocation problem. Uh, this is a cloud scheduling problem with workload uncertainty. Um, so uh, cloud scheduling, brief introduction. So uh, the protagonist of our story is going to be a cloud platform, right? Customers are gonna arrive to our platform and they wanna pay us um, to execute their workloads. Okay, and the customers have heterogeneous uh, job requirements. They have different ideas about latency tolerance, uh, which is nice for us because it means we have an optimization opportunity. Okay, so the way we want to think of this is, you know, people come in with their jobs and we can decide, okay, we'll schedule this one right away. We'll push this one off a little bit um, to try to even out usage um, so that we can get good total value while keeping sort of our peak utilization low. All right, so we can think of this as a job scheduling problem, maximize total value subject to some capacity constraint. All right, so there's a huge literature on sort of, you know, algorithms for job scheduling um, that you'd love to apply to a problem like this. Um, but unfortunately, there are some barriers to sort of applying sort of interesting scheduling algorithms in practice. One of those barriers is we often don't know how uh, large these jobs are, what the requirements of the customers actually are, even while we're executing them, right? So typically, you would model this um, in sort of the algorithms literature as like jobs arrive online and they have certain requests. Here, we start running something. We don't know when it's going to finish until it finishes sometimes, okay? And that makes it hard to sort of do interesting scheduling. Um, but, you know, it's not completely hopeless. Um, for a lot of types of jobs, we can estimate, we can get some kind of probabilistic predictions on how long these jobs will be. And so a motivating example for us um, was machine learning training pipelines, which uh, is very common, like a, a huge fraction of cloud usage, actually. Um, and so this is like, you know, a, a customer has user telemetry data that they're collecting over time. At a certain point, they're gonna, you know, get a, get a log do some processing on it, and then pass it off to the cloud and say, please train me a model um, based on this data. And so we probably know the architecture that they're trying to train. We maybe have some distributional information about what the, law, what the input size is gonna be. And we could you know, use that to try to train a model to predict you know, how long my job will require. So this is called workload prediction. There's a ton of a very active research happening right now in the systems literature on how to do that. I'm not gonna talk about how to do workload prediction. Um, this talk is about, uh, incentive issues that can arise given that I'm using probabilistic estimates to do my schedule. Okay, so can we do truthful scheduling in a world where, where jobs are probabilistic because of this sort of uh, environment? Um, so in particular, I'd love to design payment systems for my cloud that encourages customers to make their workloads predictable while still having them be flexible enough that we can do schedule. Um, then I wanna know like, I want to do this in a way that's careful so that um, customers are not uh, incentivized to game the platform, right? I don't want customers to try to fool my prediction engine to try to give them better prices. Um, and ideally, I'd like to do this predictive uh, probabilistic scheduling, um, you know, not reinventing the wheel, but sort of adding an incentive layer on top of methods we already have. Okay, um, so this is what we do in this work. Move this aside here, good. Um, so what we start, we present a framework um, that in which customers are sort of uh, allocating, uh, uh, requesting their jobs online, um, but those requests are probabilistic, okay? And now the scheduler is going to make decisions given the probabilistic information, but those plans will be contingent, okay? So the scheduler makes execution plans where the uh, prices and the actual scheduling can depend on the job realizations in certain ways. Um, then we're gonna use that framework um, and basically design uh, mechanisms for probabilistic scheduling, and it's gonna take the form of a reduction. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna think of a, a relaxed problem where jobs are um, deterministic but fractional. Imagine that we have a scheduler for that environment, and then we're gonna show how to convert that into something that works in the probabilistic environment while retaining approximately the same properties and being truthful. And the reason we wanna focus on reductions um, is because we imagine that, you know, people are gonna be designing these schedulers in a way that's tailored to their specific domain, right? And so we wanna, you know, be able to reuse that work and basically just add an extra part on top that doesn't require a lot of knowledge about the specific workloads that we'll be working with. Um, this isn't a black box reduction. We do require some assumptions about the relaxed online scheduler. Uh, we try to argue that these are mild, but uh, I'll talk about that in a few slides. And uh, just to, to give a little bit of a foreshadowing, um, something we really care about here is, is stability. All right, so because everything's probabilistic, uh, what we mean by truthfulness and things is a little bit uh, ambiguous. Um, what I'm, the sort of property I want is that for every history of realizations, right, for every state my scheduler can be in, 
you know, from that point onward, I still want to be um, approximately truthful and have my good performance again. So it's not that like I have some rare failure state, um, and if I enter it, then the world explodes. Um, we have some applications of this as well, but I'm not going to have time to go into that in this talk. The, the please see the paper. Um, okay, so how am I on time? Good, good, good. All right, let me jump right into the model. Um, so I want to imagine that I have a large supply of CPU units every time. Okay, when I say large, I mean large compared to what any single job wants. Right, it's a large market assumption. Um, my model for jobs is going to be rectangular. Um, our framework can actually handle more general things than this, but this is enough to convey the point. Um, so every job is going to require a certain number of CPUs for a certain amount of time. Um, if I give those CPUs for that contiguous block of time, then the job completes. The job becomes available to execute at some particular time. Um, and once it's available and I can start running it, um, but I can choose when exactly to start running it. And there's a utility function that decays the longer it takes me to complete. Okay, so the customer has some value that they get as a function of how long it takes me to run the job. Um, this is more general than like hard deadlines, which is very common um, in scheduling. So hard deadline would be you know a certain value, but then drops to zero at a certain point. Uh, we can uh, allow soft deadlines as well, uh, which is particularly important in this machine learning context. So so far, there's nothing probabilistic about this, right? This is just the realization of jobs. Our probabilistic part is that jobs can be submitted to our platform in advance of the time when they're ready to execute. Okay, so someone can declare their job in advance, and that declaration can be probabilistic, right? So we call this a statement of work. They come in and they tell us our utility function and a distribution over um, the job's requirements and when it might be available, right? And these are the things that are arriving at that. And we're gonna model it as being private knowledge of the customer. So the customer is gonna tell us about um, these statements of work. Now, taken literally, right? This would mean that customers are actually going in and like declaring uh, 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 distributions to us, certainly we're not saying that that would be a realistic implementation of a cloud. The reason we're modeling it this way is to, you know, abstract all the different ways a customer might game the system, okay? So um, rather than thinking of it as the customer is trying to fool a prediction engine, we're saying, we'll give the, the customer the power to just tell us whatever distribution they want, right? So they can basically fool us however they'd like to. Um, and even then, we're going to design things in such a way that they're incentivized to tell us the true distribution, okay? Good. Um, now, what is our, how, what is our scheduler going to do? Um, when a statement of work is submitted, the scheduler is going to choose an execution plan, which is like contingent decisions, right? So it says, you know, given your, your actual realized arrival time, here's when I'll start scheduling you. And given what the job actually uses, here's how much we'll pay. Um, and so this is, this latter part is particularly important. Um, we're not going to try to extract uh, expected payments up front, but rather um, people are actually going to pay for what they use. Right, so especially when jobs are, are very, uh, have very high variance, uh, we're not gonna try to, you know, punish people and paying them a lot when they actually just use a little. Uh, this is an important practical consideration. Now, what this means is the scheduler's making decisions that are probabilistic. And so in particular, the scheduler doesn't even really know exactly what it's promised to different jobs, right? So when the customer is internally trying to decide like, what do I have available in the future? It actually just has a distribution over what's available. Right. So here are possible schedulers. You know, maybe the scheduler has said, okay, there's this orange job. I don't know when it arrives, but I promised them I'll start them whenever they come in. Um, then maybe what I've promised is the thing on the left, and maybe what I've promised is the thing on the right. I'm not sure. I have a distribution. Um, and then a new statement of work comes in, and the person's describing, oh, I have some probably distribution over when my job's going to arrive and how long it's going to be. Um, and now we have to make a decision given the left and the right. Okay, what, what am I going to promise this person? Like, what's going to happen? And notice that this, you know, takes our, you know, multiverse of, of possible worlds and sort of ex and, and expands it out, right? So I come up with some execution plan. Maybe my job, you know, maybe the actual realization of the job is the one on the left, in which case this is what I promised on the right. Um, maybe it's, you know, the job arrives later in which I'm okay. There could be realizations of the state and the job where I've actually gone over supply. And we actually allow the, the scheduler to make these sorts of risks. That's fine. Um, in which case we'll just have to do preemption. Uh, sorry, um, uh, we'll have to evict jobs and cancel them. And we, our model can allow situations where like say this, you incur a penalty for doing this. All right, good. Um, so how are we actually going to do that schedule? So this is sort of the problem that the scheduler is facing. Um, well, we're gonna do a trick which is uh, relatively common in, in online uh, resource allocation, which is we're gonna relax. Uh, we're gonna do a fractional relaxation. Right, so instead of trying to keep in our minds this sort of multiverse of different uh, environments, we're going to collapse everything down to the expected usage at every point in time, right? Um, which makes the problem easier for us. Um, 
So the, the general idea is to um, keep in mind our expected usage. Every job that comes in, I'm going to interpret it as a collection of deterministic but fractional jobs, right? It needs to be a collection because different arrival times could be scheduled differently. Then I'm gonna use tools for online conduct optimization to actually schedule those things in this fractional simulated way. Okay, and there are a lot of tools sort of out there in, in the literature. Um, here's one that's, that's recent, but there's a long history here. Um, so there's, you know, nice things we can pull from that would let us do that fractional scheduling problem because there's no probabilistic. And then the nice thing is we can take those fractional schedules and reinterpret them as execution plans, right? So if I look at this, you know, where are these, these different pieces of the purple job are executed, I can actually read that off as an execution plan and say, this is my, this is what I'm going to promise to the user. Um, and the intuition that, you know, maybe this could work is that because my supply is large, concentration bounds to suggest that as long as I give myself some slack, my realized schedule should approximate this expected schedule most of the time, probably. Um, that probably is the thing that's actually going to give us a lot of trouble and is most of the, the meat of the paper. Um, before I get to that, though, let me just say quickly, um, I told you how to do the allocation, but not how to do the payments. This is where we're going to make some assumptions about how our simulated scheduler works. We're going to assume that it's truthful and that it works based on like some, some notion of like unit prices. Okay, so the mental model here is that my fractional scheduler is maintaining not just expected usage, but also like some price per unit of time um, that maybe is dynamically updating. And whenever a new job comes in, what it actually is doing is it's saying, I'm gonna give you the fractional schedule that maximizes value minus price at these you know, underlying hidden prices, and then maybe updates them in response. Now this, such a thing is truthful. It looks at first glance like this is very restrictive, like a very specific way to do things. It turns out that a lot of you know, state-of-the-art scheduling methods can be interpreted as like dual-based, you know, primal dual sort of methods. Um, and these prices are precisely corresponding to the duals, okay? And we don't actually require that it be additive like across time like this. All we require is there's some notion of like a bundle price um, and we're doing this optimization. So it actually turns out that a lot of um, schedulers actually fall into this paradigm. And if we do, then actually our, we're golden, right? So like um, now when we take our fractional schedule, go on to an execution plan, we can read off from these prices what the contingent prices should be for any given realization. Um, and I wanna point out that this actually incentivizes predictable flexible jobs, which was our goal, all right? So if a job is more predictable, right? So if the distribution has less variance, then the fractional job will be more sort of concentrated, which means the scheduler can do a better job of fitting it into like low price areas, right? So more predictability will naturally translate into lower prices um, which is exactly what, what aligns the incentives between the customer and the, and the scheduler. Great, okay, so that's the high level idea. There are a lot of challenges, um, which I can't get into in a lot of detail in this talk. Let me just briefly mention, um, the big issue is that we're trying to simulate this fractional environment, um, but of course that's not real, right? What's real is this distribution over real states. And something that looks feasible in the fractional world you know, might correspond to something that's actually infeasible in reality, right? So we're, you know, we're taking a risk here. We have this distribution over things, some of which are bad. Maybe we're in a world where the bad doesn't happen, in which case we have to evict. And so the question is, who should we evict in this situation? We need some eviction policy. And we need to do it in a way that, that respects incentives. And um, so the idea, um, one, of the, one of the ideas of the paper is to evict in a particular way, which is, reverse order by submission time, right? Not arrival time of the job, and it doesn't depend on the actual like value or size of the job, just most recently submitted job gets evicted first. Why do we do that? We do it for incentive reasons, right? We, so think of it from the perspective of some job J. Job J is trying to decide, okay, am I gonna be evicted? But job J knows that any job submitted after job J is gonna be evicted first. So job J only gets evicted if there's still a problem after everyone after them is being sub, uh, after submitted after them is evicted, which means um, they know they can figure out they're probably being evicted given jobs that are submitted before them. We're almost uh, out of time. Okay, good. Um, we have like can maybe one more minute. Please. Yep. Yeah, of course. Um, and so what this does is this. Um, uh, yeah. So what does this do? This. Uh, generates, a, so, okay, so that means I can, I know the eviction um, probability at the point in which this job is submitted, 
which means the scheduler can take it into account. So we actually modify the, the eviction, the, the scheduling rules slightly to take these eviction probabilities into account. And this lets us actually generate, get, get good incentives even in this uh, world. This causes some funny synchronization issues because now we're doing something slightly different than the fractional world. Um, and a lot of the technical part of the paper is trying to make sure that these things stay you know, in sync and not be synchronized too much. Um, but please uh, move to, go to the paper to see details about this. It's related to the, the recent theory literature on um, stability with, with online pricing, uh, which is a beautiful set of theory that's, that's coming together. It relates to correlation decay and Martindale, Martindale concentration. Um, so putting this all together, we get this theorem that basically says, uh, if I have a fractional scheduler, I can turn it into a, um, a, a, a probabilistic scheduler without too much loss and without too much overhead in terms of running time. Um, Good. Uh, so just to conclude up, um, we looked at incentives and workload prediction. Um, doing appropriate pricing can incentivize predictable jobs. The natural next step would be to actually take this layer and stick it on top of real state-of-the-art predict uh, workload prediction um, and double check that in practice, it's really not um, adding too much overhead in terms of the, the performance issues. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, a great talk. Uh, does anyone uh, have questions? I don't see. Uh, so I, I have uh, one question. Uh, does anything change in your like setting when there are uh, dependencies between the jobs? So for example, uh, I require the outputs of like n, n jobs before me so that I can execute. Well, okay. Good. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So um, the, as long as it's all like a single customer, so you could imagine that the, so this was like a rectangular job model. Mm -hmm. You can imagine a more complicated job model where I have like multiple pieces and I need to finish this one before that one and so on. Um, things should work out there. Basically the, when we do our fractional relaxation, that model will turn into some set of constraints on constraints. how to do the fractional thing. And mm -hmm. as long as I have a scheduler that can do that, then I can move to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And my understanding is that a lot of the state of the art in fractional scheduling couldn't handle those sorts of things. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, great. Uh, let's go now. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. And let's go to the next talk now uh, by Alan Tran, uh, who works on content programming in Netflix and the details, uh, that entails using statistics and machine learning to optimize Netflix's uh, content slate. Uh, yes, thank thank you. Give me two seconds. I gotta adjust my privacy settings. Sorry. I have to rejoin. Give me two seconds. Yeah, in the meantime, does anyone else have uh, questions for Brendan? Uh, can I ask a quick question? Hello, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's a very nice talk. I want, can you repeat what is the general idea of this mechanism design, maybe in one sentence. Uh, sorry, the problem or the solution? The solution. Yeah, so we're gonna reduce to a relaxed problem that's not, that's deterministic but fractional. Mm -hmm. um, then we're gonna set up an eviction rule that lets us estimate the probability of eviction because mm -hmm. of the differences between the fractional and the, um, the real world. Um, and then we are going to do some probabilistic analysis to make sure that those the simulation and reality don't get too far out of sync with each other. So we oh. I see the, I mean, yeah. you mentioned the concentration bound part. Okay. Yes. Seems, um, which, uh, yeah, I'd see. love to talk about, but please see the paper or have yeah. me talk to you about it separately. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 